Hey everyone, welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, thanks for joining us today. And if you've listened before, welcome back. I have been really looking forward to this episode, which features just two of the most thoughtful people I've ever met when it comes to thinking about and working with the, our minds. Uh, first, I'm here as usual with Dr. Rick Hansen. So, Dad, how are you doing today? I'm mean, really touched, Forrest. I mean, you've literally never said that. Oh, well, there you go. I totally mean it. 100% authentically. Really? Honestly, you kind of blew me away there. I, I know <laughs> that our other that our guest, Dr. Richard Schwartz, <laughs> genuinely is. But thank you, Forrest. You kind of really got me there. Well, you are so welcome. And as you said, we're joined also by a very special guest today, the creator of the Internal Family Systems Model of Therapy, Dr. Richard Schwartz. And if you're maybe not familiar with IFS, we usually experience ourselves as one unified self, one I who is looking through our eyes. But if you look a little closer, you'll probably find that there are actually a lot of different characters or parts that are running around inside of you. Some help us stay focused and on track. Others help us relax or protect ourselves in response to stress. Then there might be some other softer, more vulnerable parts that we've maybe pushed away over time. And Dr. Schwartz is the author of a number of books and over 50, 60 articles, something like that, focused on IFS. He is very prolific. His newest book is No Bad Parts, Healing Trauma and Restoring Wholeness with the Internal Family Systems Model. And he can add to his list of accomplishments being one of the very, very few people we've ever had on the podcast more than once. So Dr. Schwartz, how are you doing today? Very honored to hear that. And I was really glad to be present for that. That moment between the two of you, it's very lovely. Totally. I, I mean, I felt the same way. I, I thought it was so funny, Dad, that that kind of like took you by surprise there. It's very authentically how I feel. <laughs> no better Christmas present for this time of year. <laughs> 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 we are recording at the end of 2023. We'll probably be posting this in early 2024. For So we're just a few days ahead of Christmas here to kind of bring people behind the curtain. I would love to start with just a quick and general introduction to the IFS model. For people who might not be familiar with it, or maybe who didn't listen to our first conversation together. Okay, well, you gotta give us a good start on it. But um, basic idea is that, like you said, the mind isn't unitary; it's not one; it's actually multiple. That we're not so different from people who carry that diagnosis. It used to be called multiple personality disorder. What are called alters for those those people are what I call parts. So full range personalities, each with different talents and resources. And uh, if they're not hurt, they're wonderful and they're helpless in our lives in various ways, different ways. But when we when they get hurt, they take on what I call burdens, which are extreme beliefs and emotions that come from the trauma or the attachment injury, the bad parenting. And those extreme beliefs and emotions then attach to them almost like a virus and then drive the way they operate thereafter. And they also can get frozen in time during the trauma. And, you know, if you were to ask some of these parts how old they thought you are, you get a single digit most of the time because they still are living back when, when you were five and they think you're still that age and they have to protect you the way they did back then. Some of them, like you said, are very vulnerable. That They're like the inner children you've heard of. Uh, and before they get hurt, they're delightful, but they're also the most sensitive parts of us. So they get hurt the most. Once they carry those burdens, we want to get away from them because they have the power to overwhelm us and make us feel all that again. And so we have a kind of natural impulse to lock them in inner basements. And everybody around us tells us to, because this is a rugged individualist culture and you just move on from trauma. You don't look back. You don't wallow in the feelings. You just move on and not realizing that you're not just moving on from the memories and maybe emotions, you're actually locking away some of your most precious qualities simply because they got hurt. So those we call exiles. And when you get a lot of exiles, other parts have to leave their uh, naturally valuable states and become what we call protectors, like you said. 
and some of them protect by managing your life so that the exiles don't get triggered again. And they'll do that by trying to get everybody to like you or make you look good all the time. Or they're what's called the ego in the spirituality world. And so in other systems, they'd also be called the defenses, probably. And those don't always work, and your exiles get triggered. And when that happens, it's a big emergency because, as I say, this raw emotion comes blasting out from the basement. You've got it locked in and can take you back into those scenes and make you feel everything you felt back then. And so there's another set of parts who will immediately go into action to deal with that emergency in some impulsive and often extreme way necessary, whatever it takes. And we call those firefighters because they're fighting these flames of raw emotion coming from the exiles. And they don't care about the collateral damage to your body or to your family or whatever. They just know if they don't do this job, that you're going to die. And that's their belief often. And so they might be the addictions or uh, rage often or dissociation or it's a lot of common firefighter activities. So that's the map to this territory that I created because when I entered it and Clyde started telling me about these parts, I didn't know what they were talking about, but I got curious. And because I came from a family therapy background, I had systems thinking. So I wasn't just trying to get to know one part. I was much more interested in how they related to each other as a system. The other big aspect of IFS uh, and I, you know, very interested in Rick's take on this, is that in addition to these parts, and when they open space inside, it releases what I call the self with a capital S. I can't remember exactly what we did last time for us, but if I was working with your critic, and I asked you how you felt toward it, and you said, I hate it, I, would, I might say, Makes sense, but let's see if the one who hates it could give us a little space to get to know it. And if that part was willing to separate a little bit, and I ask mm -hmm. you now, how do you feel toward it? You may well say some version of, I'm kind of curious about why it calls me names all day, and I actually feel sad that it has to do this. So you would have just the act of getting that angry one to separate, have gone from rage toward it to compassion and curiosity and confidence relative to it. And when I would ask clients, now, what part of you is that? They'd say some version of, that's not a part like these others. That's myself. So I came to call that the self with a capital S. And now we, had a, we just had our 40-year anniversary celebration. 40 years later, we can safely say that that self is in everybody, can't be damaged. It is just beneath the surface of these parts such that when they open the space, it pops out. For me, that's the big discovery of IFS, that hmm. uh, in contrast to a lot of psychological theories like attachment theory, which says that to have any of that, you had to have had a certain kind of parenting at a critical stage in your childhood. Uh, it, it just is there. It doesn't, doesn't need to be developed. And that blew my mind because I was into attachment theory at the time. And I, did, I couldn't ground it until I started looking or was told to start looking at various spiritual traditions. So I think that's what I had stumbled onto was a way to access that place that many spiritual traditions know about, but pretty quickly in, in most people and to use it in the psychotherapy uh, endeavor. A little bit about capital S self. I find it's helpful uh, as someone who's really looked at conventional psychological and Western philosophical views of the self, so-called, through the lens of the Eastern tradition, especially Buddhist, which deconstruct it. And so I find it's helpful to be careful about languaging, not to be pedantic, mm -hmm. but I've actually read sentences in which the word self is used in two different ways in a single sentence. The one usage is to the person, process, 
broadly, you know, a particular mind-body process occurring over time in the stream of reality. Okay, so you're a person, force is a person, I'm a person, all persons disperse eventually. Then there's self or selfing, this presumption of some kind of unitary entity inside that is uh, enduring and independent and unitary. Uh, and the question then becomes, is there actually such a, such a one? Although such a one is continually presumed. So that's a bit of a context for how I would come into the languaging of this. And then it does seem completely true that I would use words like under, but somehow under the parts struggling with each other, under that mm-hmm. is, is a knowing, uh, an inherent wakefulness that's benevolent and absolutely, as you say, indestructible. So I, I guess I'm trying to say I really affirm and get value from you know, what you're saying here. And then the question is, what are the causes and conditions of that underlying capital S self? Is it as, you know, I'm perfectly comfortable with this view. Is it simply a, a wonderful process that's innate in our own biology? Or in some ways, does its existence require some kind of edging into mysterious transpersonal matters? How about we just kind of ask right there, do you extend it into the transpersonal or do you just kind of leave it inside the natural frame of the Big Bang universe? When I encountered it, and again, it was contrary to what I expected, mm. it, particularly in people who had horrible, horrible childhoods, and there was no way you could find somebody that they got it from, in other words. I, so then I started to think, well, maybe it is some kind of biological, evolutionary uh, aspect of people. But the more I did it, the less that could hold up as a possibility. I'm not sure ah. exactly why. You know, I come from a highly scientific uh, family, very skeptical. Or My father was really anti-religion, actually. It was a really hard sell. I really had to be convinced that, that this could be something spiritual. But one of the things my father always told me was, Follow the data, even if it takes you way outside your paradigm. Mm. And so it took me way outside. It has taken me way outside my paradigm to the point where now I believe that it is spiritual. It isn't just something that's unique to us, that it's the place in us that's connected to everybody else and every other uh, living being. And that there is a, a big self sort of the, the kind of, I love the the particle and wave idea from quantum physics. Yeah. A photon can be both. So for me, there's a wave state of self that you get to when you meditate in certain ways or psychedelics get you into that where you don't feel like you have boundaries. You feel very yeah. um, non-dual and connected with everything. Which I've experienced now through psychedelics. And then I, as I remember coming back from that state, thinking, oh shit, now <laughs> I'm coming into this body and I have all these boundaries and I feel separate from everybody. Uh, but it's really the same self. It's just a piece of, like a drop of that ocean that's in each of us. So that's how I've come to think about it. And yeah, I'm curious how that sits with you. Experientially, and people listening can actually start to do this even, but especially they probably know it as an experience. In other words, what's it like to be you? You, I'm using in the broadest sense as person process. What's it like, what's it like to be you when things get really quiet in your mind? When the parts start dropping out, right? They get calmer. It's not that you're suppressing them in any way. You're moving more into just classic open awareness Right, you know, uh, shikantaza, just sitting, you know, MBSR type uh, states of being, right? And there's clearly an ongoingness of being, even as there's very, very little activity of any parts. And um, that, in other words, what remains when the yep. when the parts settle out? It's just, to use a metaphor, uh, if, if the mind is a little bit like a pond, 
uh, the, the surface can have a lot of waves in it, a fair amount of turbulence, but as the waves gradually quiet, what's the, what's the nature of the surface of the pond? Mm. That's fair. Yeah, in the moment by moment awareness, whatever may also be true in its depths under the waterline of consciousness. Yeah, and that sense of ongoing being, right? Would you describe that as what you mean by this capital S self? Yeah. Uh huh. Maybe one of the distinctions, because as I've talked to other mindfulness people and Buddhist teachers, is that that capital S self, that sort of um, serene pond, isn't just a passive observer, but actually can become yeah. a very active leader, both in the inner world and the outer world. Yeah. And I don't know if that's a distinction with you or not, but that kind of amazed me when I was working with clients and they would access that place yeah. that you just described. They didn't want to just look at their thoughts and emotions. They wanted to go to them and actually embrace them and start to help them yeah. from that place. So uh, I don't know if that works for you or, or not. Yeah. And I hope the force is not itching too much to, you know, to <laughs> help us get. Him. I, I, I do, I do want to, I do want to jump in really quick here. I, I do want, I want you to answer uh, Dick's question, Dad, yeah. because I think it's a phenomenal question. But also, I, just to point something out, I think it's so funny that we've kind of started with the end here. Uh -huh. and, and what I mean by that is that Dick, a lot of the time when I've heard you talk about IFS and and the the pieces of IFS therapy that I've done myself, one of the guiding goals of it is to help people get more in touch with this underlying sense of, call it what you will. You call it capital S self. I mean, the IFS model, it's the idea of what's there when the parts kind of drop away, that's like right. you guys were saying. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the goal, is, is to find that thing. And so from the very beginning of this conversation, y'all in your inquiry found, found the target um, because it's a place of great interest. And it's particularly a place of great interest, I think, for people who have done a lot of work in this area, including a lot of personal work. Neat. So they're kind of a little further down the road. But um, my experience as somebody who's walked into the therapy office is that there's a lot more of a preoccupation with defenses, difficulties in a person's life that are getting in the way of that natural self-expression. There's kind of a focus on that as opposed to more of a focus on the target that they're searching for, which might be that like pure expression of self, if that makes sense. So uh, I think it's funny that we're going to kind of like spend time at the end and then loop back to the beginning and kind of go from there. And I think part of what's useful is to recognize the frame of intent or aim in which we're exploring something. Part of what we're talking about is the capacity to uh, rest in awareness of rather than be identified with. And mm -hmm. that which helps disidentification in general is certainly very, very foregrounded in IFS and in many other places, including in Buddhism. And that is, I think, of general value for people who may, may never do an IFS therapy. Just learning how to step back from and witness and disidentify from whatever's going on in your mind, including react, especially reactive patterns. So that's really helpful. Totally agree. Yeah. And so this process of training in which you just take even a few minutes a day and let your mind get kind of quiet. What's it like to be you when things settle down, right? And uh, to get to know that place and to, especially the somatic embodied feeling of it. And then you develop, you move from the states of that to the trait of being able to rest in that calm abiding where you're present with, and you might be actually really upset about stuff, but there's a core in you that's not upset. And I think maybe that's part of what we're saying. That is what we're saying. We're talking about the same thing there. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And then you're exactly right. You zeroed in on sometimes it's really useful to open to the wisdom, you know, the, the insight, the encouragement of that inherently benevolent and wakeful and wise core applied to oneself, like you're saying. I think at other times it's really helpful to... To be, to to make no efforts at all in the mind, and to yeah. simply, other than the minimal efforts necessary to remain awake, present, essentially, partly as a training. 
And then the last thing I'll just drop in, to be able to relate to consciousness as a whole, because the structure of suffering, and also the structure of good, many good things, but certainly the structure of suffering always is parts struggling with other parts. And so being able to train in the capacity to rest as yourself as a whole, including awareness, awareness and its objects, consciousness as a whole, is really useful. And that's really interesting for people, where you're, rest, you're, you're abiding as, you're being as a whole in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, that's really helpful. Okay, I'll pause right there. What do you make of all that? Well, it depends on what you mean by as a whole. Yeah, you are a whole system, but you still have these parts. So that's right. They're all included in the whole of your consciousness in the moment. Yeah. So you're resting, for my language would be, mm -hmm. you're getting your parts to open a lot of space inside. You're separating from them. You can notice them, but you're also asking them to really let you just embody, really let you just be in this place you just described so beautifully. Yeah. And, and to trust that, to kind of, uh, as a practice, know that it, it helps to, to be in the world from this place and that they don't have to always take over and run everything. And so, so I, I'm very supportive of that kind of a practice. Mm -hmm. And at other times, like you said, particularly when you want to do some healing, to access that place and then come to these parts with all those great qualities. I mentioned three, I think, earlier, but we have what we call the eight C's of self-leadership, calm and curiosity and uh, confidence and compassion, but also creativity, clarity, courage, and connectedness. So yeah. Those, those are the qualities. I mean, you mentioned others, and, and there are a bunch of others. Those are the ones I've uh, kind of attached to, partly because they begin with the letter C, and it's nice for literal purposes, but also those, for me, seem to be the most valuable qualities for the healing process, which is, you know, this is a psychotherapy, so that's what I'm focused on. So, so we get people in that place and then ask them how they feel toward these different parts that they're observing. And then we have them from a place of compassion say that they care about them and, and see how the parts react and then, and, and so on. And so self shifts in that context from just being a passive witness to becoming a very active healer, basically, of the inner system. And it, become, it becomes a positive cycle. The more the parts unburden, which is basically a quota to healing in this world, but the easier it becomes to meditate. The more you can be in that place of stillness for longer and longer periods, and the more you can lead your life from that place. In my own experience of doing parts work, it's paradoxically true, just like you say, that the more you listen to parts, the quieter they get, or something like that. They feel included, they yeah. kind of settle down. And I imagine, you know, like King Arthur's Round Table, this big committee space uh, in which there are different parts. And when you actually start listening to them, they become less strident and more reasonable. It's kind of counterintuitive. Do you point people to a whole that includes capital S self plus all the parts? And how do you do that? So there are four goals of IFS. We didn't talk about this first one that much, which is the uh, helping these parts leave their extreme roles and states and become who they're designed to be. So the, the liberation of parts and transformation of them is the first goal. The second goal we have talked about, which is to help all of them come to trust, to trust self as a leader. And then the third goal, which you're hinting at here, is for the parts to begin to get to know each other and depolarize and start to work together and like each other. And so to bring more harmony to this inner system, not such that they disappear, 
But so you don't notice them because they're not standing out in the way they were. You know, I'm careful with the word wholeness because I, I'm so allergic to the idea that there's just one mind. But people feel much more whole. They feel much more integrated as these outlying parts are brought back home. And just to get a little further into the metaphysics of this, it turns out that each of these parts have what I call self, too. You know, I spent some time working with DID clients, people with really extreme parts that didn't know or didn't like each other. And Dissociative identity disorder, multiple personality disorder, so-called, yeah. So I would have to spend a lot of time getting to know one part, and I would become the, you know, we couldn't access their self, so I had to do it. And the part would start talking about its parts. Huh. And, wow. And, and it would start, we could get it to access itself and work with its part. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, from an ontological point of view, it's, you know, turtles all the way down, apparently. I don't know. I haven't gone much further down. But Do you ever think about some kind of general purpose functionality in the human mind that, uh, that can essentially generate selfhood? And then that multiple per that general purpose functionality then gets deployed or in involved with each of the parts and then the parts of the parts? Yeah, I mean, it, it just feels like fractals to me. I mean, it's, wow. at some level, it just totally makes sense. That third goal, as, as, as in particular, as they depolarize, as self becomes the leader and, and can go to each polarized part and then bring them together and help them talk it through, just like we did in family therapies. Really, I just took a lot of family therapy and brought it to this inner system. Yeah. As that happens, the parts, you know, people just feel more whole. They feel more unitary, even though the parts don't disappear. Thanks for letting me uh, kind of interrogate all that. Oh, sure. I would love to ask here about applying some of the things that we've talked about for the past 20, 30 minutes or so to a sort of practical situation or a practical problem that a person might be dealing with. Because one of the things you've said a couple of times here, Dick, is the notion of extreme behaviors. And we're trying to, um, one of the goals being to unburden these parts of what they think that they need to do in order to keep the system safe. So I would love to paint kind of a pretty typical picture of a family of problems that a person might be dealing with. And then you could kind of talk me through how you would think about those family of issues inside of more of an IFS framework. Does that kind of make sense? Sure. So let's say that somebody walks into the room there, there to do therapy with you, who is more sensitive or emotionally vulnerable. Maybe they, uh, to use attachment language, they're more anxiously attached. They're a highly sensitive person in quotes, use whatever phrase you like. They tend to feel pretty overwhelmed emotionally. They tend to struggle with more of their emotional regulation. And they have a really tough time internalizing nurturance experiences. To use my dad's language, they have a tough time with taking in the good. And this is causing a lot of issues in their relationships because they're prone to those kind of clinging complaints that tend to end up pushing people away. There's a lot of love me, love me, oh, you're not loving me quite the right way, whatever it might be. And their goal, they're coming in because they're having these issues and they want to resolve them in some kind of a way. And this might happen by becoming more internally resourced. That's kind of a phrase that they've heard before. And they're like, yeah, that sounds good to me. Or maybe they want to build up a, a stronger sense of kind of authority inside of themselves or the ability to actually go out and do things in the world mm -hmm. and the feeling like they can do that in some kind of a positive way. How would you think about a common set of issues like that through more of the IFS framework? Sure. I actually wrote a book about this, but I'm kind of sorry. It's called "You're the One." You, you're the one you've been waiting for. Such a person generally had some childhood experiences that left them feeling very uh, alone, maybe, or uh, desperate, or to be redeemed and made to feel good about themselves, or and uh, and so they have these exiles that perpetually feel anxious and uh, needy and wanting some kind of validation or love from somebody that they didn't get from some caretaker, usually. And when you have a bunch of those exiles 
and you think you've got to get that from another person, which most of us think. Most of us are searching for that person who can redeem us, who can comfort us and protect us, protect these particular parts. When that's the case, you've got all these protectors who are out there looking for a certain, you know, character who can, who fits the, who fits the profile of what you didn't get from your parent. Uh. Looks, often looks or acts like that parent. And, and when you find that person and they are, they do love you, they do what you wanted, you desperately need it. There's this kind of infatuation because finally, you know, I'm redeemed. I'm not worthless. But generally that person actually is like your parent. And so they wind up hurting you in the same way. And then you go into all these protector projects to either get them to change or, or get more clingy that way, or, or, you know, they're not the right person. I've got a, that person still out there. I've made a mistake. Or, so, um, so the, I first answer to that is to help that person find those, well, first get permission from their protectors to go to these exiles and for their self to become that, that, um, attachment figure, good, good attachment figure, uh, this kind of good inner parent to these parts that so desperately think they have to get it from somebody else in the outside world. And once they can trust self to get it and self becomes the primary attachment figure, their partner can be the secondary attachment figure. And so their partner feels all the relief from not having to constantly take care of their exiles and reassure them and, and not be subject to their protectors when it when doesn't do it quite right. And, and so that's the, the basic idea. And, and to not only have self go and hold these little ones and comfort them, but also ask where they're stuck in the past and get them out of there and help them unload these extreme beliefs and emotions they got about what they need in a partner and so on. Well, I'm absorbing this and I'm doing therapy on my own mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll spare you some of the intimate details, but no, I'm, I'm in it. Well, this, I, this kind of goes beyond Forrest's question, Dick. You know, I'm getting to know you a little here and I'm very struck by the feeling of your kindness and kindness as central in IFS and the, the doing of it. So at first, I just wanted to say that. That's, you know, Thank it's, you. It's, Thank you, yeah, I really mean it. Um, and I, I said so to you as well. <laughs> I'm two for two on Christmas presents <laughs> <laughs> this episode. That's the second one. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm just kind of feeling my way into it. I mean, IFS, because of course, it's dealing with complexity inner complexity. The, the account of I, IFS is fairly complex. And through all that complexity, though, is this kind of radical commitment to kindness in relationship to all that. Yeah, totally. Thank you. I guess I find myself wondering how that emerged in you, in, your, mm. in the genesis or the role of that in the genesis of IFS, your own journey as a therapist? Yeah, so uh, if you'd known me maybe 20 years ago, you wouldn't uh, say that. So relative to what I just described in terms of the client you presented for us, so I came out of my family with these exiles that felt totally worthless. And uh, I was, I don't know how much to get into this, but I'm, the oldest of six boys and born to this high powered academic mm. medicine psych father. And I just didn't have a head for school. I think I had ADD actually undiagnosed. And so I was terrible at school and drove him crazy because I was supposed to be a doctor. 
three of my brothers are very prominent. And so I was a big loser in his eyes. And so I had that. And then I, for various reasons, had a problem with my mother and, and didn't um, feel at all connected to her. So I was pretty much on my own and felt pretty worthless. And, mm. and that, you know, drove me to bring something to the world to prove that I was valuable. Drove other parts of me to do that. And to, to build this model, I had to rely on the, on the driver part, but also on part, on parts that didn't give a shit what people thought. Cause I got a lot of attack in the early days for this idea. And so I had to rely on this part that could say, okay, I don't care what they think. Yeah. And so that combination of this mm -hmm. sort of maniacal driven part and the part that didn't care much about people doesn't make for a good leader of a community. <laughs> as, as I presented the model and people started to be drawn to it, I found myself in that role of being some kind of uh, leader. And I was lucky that I had some students who let me know that I was way out of line in a lot of ways and I had to work on myself. Mm. And so uh, I took that seriously and I, started trading sessions with people and, and really did a lot, a lot of healing of those exiles that I mentioned so that that driven part could calm down and the protector that let me not care about people could relax back and not ironically, I became a much better therapist because hmm. in the early days I was attracted to the idea that self could do it because I didn't want to have to have people clinging on to me. You know, I, I, I didn't like that psychoanalytic thing where you become the, the self to the client's parts. And, and that was my parts that didn't want that. And then, but people could sense that. They could sense that I wasn't fully open-hearted with them and that would get in the way. And so I, I got that feedback and started to work on that to the point where now you know, when I'm with somebody, they really do sense that, the kindness you're talking about. And, the, and when clients protect you sense that, they relax back quite quickly, even in serious kinds of sessions. So, yeah. so I can access, self is kind of contagious. So if I can bring a lot of self, that pulls for the client self as well. And then... When their self is there, then we can start doing the work. An obvious feature of IFS and of just how we're talking throughout this conversation is this extreme personification of aspects of personality, um, aspects of our mind, aspects of how we think and move through the world, just the language of parts of viewing these different aspects of ourselves as different characters in this kind of internal play is totally personified. And it's, it's phantom to some extent, right? Um, like there's not an actual physical character that we're interacting with, but we can really feel like we're doing that inside of ourselves when we're having direct access or conversation with a part or whatever else it is that's kind of going on in there. And other approaches to therapy have come up with other kinds of language to describe the function of parts. Like we'll talk in terms of defenses or uh, take a purely behavioral stance with like inputs and outputs in different systems. and. I'm wondering what what you think is particularly valuable for people, many of whom will never have an IFS session. Most of the people listening to this podcast right now will never go to therapy at all. Um, of thinking of their internal system in this way, and particularly in this like heavily character driven, kind of personified way, as opposed to just thinking in terms of like, oh, that's just my defensive strategy, or something like that. So there's a lot in what you just asked. So yeah, take your time. Yeah, I'll take my time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for me, it isn't a metaphor. It's not uh, you know something that I'm putting on to people or, or having having them think of it as a, as a framework that I came up with. Mm -hmm. um, for me, these are real inner entities. They, they're 
they're they're not physical in the sense that you can't reach out and touch them physically, but everything else about them is quite real. You know, because I came to it thinking, oh, because my clients started talking about these parts, and well, that's a nice metaphor for understanding your mind and your thoughts and emotions, and let's just go with it. And then at some point, I couldn't deny the fact that it wasn't a metaphor, that there was something actually mm. quite real to this. And what happens in this inner world has profound implications on, on what happens in the outer world. And so once I got to that point and started taking it very, very seriously as something real, everything got a lot better. Now, in terms of the other question of what's the value in thinking about it that way? Yeah, what do you think really serves people in doing uh, that? Aside yeah. from the fact that it's quite real. <laughs> yeah. Um, the value is if you think of these as simply extreme beliefs or emotions or behaviors, or I forget what else you call them, defenses or defenses. Yeah, just the typical like psychoanalytic language. Yeah, yeah. If that's what you think they are, it doesn't make sense to try and talk to them or get to know them or try to yeah. have compassion for them. They're just the structure of the mind that sort of mechanical. And you need to find a way to get them out of your way. Yeah. And too yeah. often that involves ignoring them or exiling them or, or fighting with them. Uh, and that's the opposite of what we're trying to do. Totally. And, and for me, it's I, I, just what you said there about the compassionate aspect of it and the collaborative aspect of it. Yeah. Like for me, in terms of my own process of, I don't know, the, the inner work that I've done over the last five to 10 years, that those notions have been totally essential for me um, in anything that I've done. The notion of working with aspects of myself and attempting to move them to a position in the system uh, with their consent that is more kind of appropriate for that tendency as opposed to kind of going into conflict with it. Yeah. Because um, a lot of the time we, we construct a real narrative around defensive behavior where defenses get a really bad rap in totally. like pop psychology. Yeah. You know, your, your defenses are problematic. Your job is to get rid of your defenses, stop being so defensive, whatever language is that people use. But the reality is that those behaviors are there for reasons. That's right. They exist to serve a purpose. And it's a very, very functional purpose most of the time in most people when we're not dealing with like extreme pathology here. Even extreme pathology. Even extreme sure, pathology. Sure, yeah, there you go. Yeah, and the thing I would add is that it's not just pop psychology, it's also spirituality. Too often, from my point of view, the ego is seen as a big obstacle, and something that you have to get away from and ignore. And, it's, and that's just a collection of little managers trying to keep you safe. How do you think about this, Dad? Yeah, I mean, you're describing, Dick, you're, you're asserting um, an extraordinary, pervasive process of personification in the human mind, right? In which various parts are personified and they sometimes even in a fractal way say, have parts that have parts, et cetera. Mm -hmm. let's, let's take that as true. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Do gorillas do that? Do dogs do that? Do lizards do that? Do crabs do that? And 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 et cetera, we don't know for sure. And wow, how would it be that this profound general purpose module, I described it earlier, of personification, this functionality, the right, uh, would, would evolve, would emerge in the human mind. In terms of the Buddhist project, uh, if I could say mm -hmm. it broadly, one major element of it is to recognize the emptiness of all phenomena as a means to the end of di disengagement, detachment, non-clinging, uh, which, which one does toward the end of the ultimate forms of inner peace. Okay, so here we have on the one hand, this tendency toward personification, which tends to reify, essentialize, that's probably the best word, you know, into entities inside. On the other hand, we have the value of being able to regard any and all phenomena, inner and outer, right? Thoughts and things, 
as existing emptily, made of parts that are connected and changing, right? And so how, how do we put those two things together, including, wow, how, how could it be what, that what you're saying is true in terms of the personification, the proliferation of personification inside us down to a very granular level? Wow. Yeah. Again, I'll quibble a little with the language. Please. Personification sounds like it's something you're doing. No, I don't mean it like that. Just this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Bottom up. So process. how could it, how could it be that this is the nature of the mind and yeah that we come into the world with these parts? Uh, in terms of why it's like that, you know, all I can say is that that. One mind can't do and think and act in all the ways we have to to survive. So it does make sense that we would have, <laughs> That's we would have a bunch of them working on different <laughs> aspects of things, like a company, you know? So, Like Whitman said, Walt Whitman, I am, a, I am multitudes, right? You got to be I multitudes. I multitudes, yeah. <laughs> you got to yeah, be, absolutely. what is it? That to play, you know the one, you got to be somebody before you can become nobody? And that, that emptiness you talk about, um, there's a guy whose name I can't pull up right now as a Buddhist scholar and, and wrote it because he also got a diapass and he wrote a piece about how what the Buddhists call no self is really what I'm calling self. Huh. It's, it's the <laughs> emptiness that exists when parts open space and it's just pure space yeah. inside. But people said that was myself. So I, that's why I called it self with a capital S. Yeah. But it's really just getting your, ego to open a lot of space and that's what's there so so they all exist in this emptiness all that fits pretty well yeah with buddhism the only issues i have with buddhism are, are those some buddhist practices that don't like certain parts and like the ego i was talking about you have these good qualities and you have these bad qualities and you need to replace the good with the Bad uh -huh. with the good. Let's go there for a second because there there is a certain um well there 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 is definitely a progression in practice in which we ultimately we abandon. We truly extinguish certain qualities. And it's not that they're bad, bad, it's that pragmatically they create suffering and harm. So, but there is that notion of the grad, you know, nibbana means nirvana means extinguishing, putting out, right? No more fuel. So ultimately we defuel. There's this notion of withdrawing fuel, nutrients from different aspects of ourselves. And yeah. that would be quite inconsistent, I think, with your approach. Totally. You're you're not trying to defuel the inner critic, let's nope. say. You're trying to be friendly. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're being kind toward it, right? You're We'd be afraid. I, yeah. I just did a training at a treatment center called High Watch. We're training the whole staff in IFS, and they're yeah. twelve steppers. You know, it was total twelve step. And and so they had an attitude about the addictive part, and they oh yeah they would try to get people to ignore it or or you know override it and so on, and we. I'm doing these demos where we're going to the addictive part and we're loving it up and we're thanking it for its service and and how it helps save their lives and learning about what it's protecting and negotiating permission to go to what it protects to get it out of this role so it can transform and be who it's designed to be. So for so many things like that, this is really, you know, it's in some ways... Um, Counterintuitive. Oh yeah. Have you ever had someone from the Buddhisty world say, "Hey, let's apply this IFS approach to the so-called hindrances or the poisons or afflictions, like greed and yeah, hatred?" Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That's... Have you ever done that? Have you ever played that out? Uh, yes. There's a. I'm doing a one-day workshop with a woman named. Uh... Lama Willa Baker, do you oh, know yeah. that name? Yeah, not personally, but I know of her, yeah. So she's now in DIFS, and she's now renouncing all that uh, language about emotions and thoughts. And, yeah. And so we're going to talk about all that. And she's now doing a very different practice with her 
followers. No, I think it's really great. Like just to name them for people like greed, like say the greed parts or the greed tribe, because parts have parts, right? Like, That's right. okay, how would we approach the greed tribe or the hatred tribe? Yeah, totally. Doubt, the doubt tribe, pernicious doubt. Okay, great. Uh, laziness, sloth, torpor, that one check, right? Let me pause you, Rick, because just calling them that yeah. takes away their humanity. For sure, cool, yeah. The greed part is a part that got stuck in the role of trying to acquire a lot of things to protect yeah. you. But it isn't pure greediness. It's really just a part stuck in a bad role. Yeah. And that's going back to our earlier discussion of why is this a valuable way to think about it? Because if you think of it as just greed or you think of just envy or all the things you just mentioned, then it makes sense to see them as poisons you need to get away from. But if you see them as valuable inner beings who got stuck in roles they hate and would like to get out if they could, then you're going to relate to them entirely differently. This is incredibly good. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. I want to kind of take some of the inquiry that you guys are doing here about the non-pathologizing nature of IFS, yeah. to, mm -hmm. to put that phrase on it, one step further. Because my understanding is that IFS is like pretty radical in terms of that non-pathologizing stance, exactly like you guys have been talking about. Like right. These yes. are all just functional if we interact with them in a more positive and supportive way. And when I say them, I mean these structures or tendencies or characters or tribes inside of the mind. Let me pause you there too, Forrest, mm -hmm. and, and shift that language a little bit. Many of them are not functional while they're in these roles. They actually are causing lots of damage. Yes. But that isn't yeah. who they are. And they, yes. they think they need to do this. They're, they have good intentions, but they become very functional when they're released from these roles. Totally. I wonder how you think about something like clinical level depression, where somebody looks around their life and they say, my circumstances are not depressing in kind of objectively. Like I've got a pretty functional life. I've got a pretty normal support system. It's not perfect because life isn't perfect, but there's not something that is going on around me that would immediately lead to my clinical depression or something like that. I've done a fair amount of work inside of the mind. It feels like this is just kind of how I'm wired. Um, this person then goes and takes an antidepressant, feels a good bit better, not perfect, but like good enough better. Inside of how you think about something like that, Dick, is this more of like, oh, well, that's kind of like a biological issue and we just sorted out their neurochemistry, they were good to go? Or do you think that there's kind of an IFS answer to that person's situation? Or is it just case by case? For many conditions, you know, we, we do it sometimes with schizophrenics and people like that, or yeah. you know, even with alcoholics and so on. I think that people have genetic predispositions for certain kinds of conditions, and depression may be one of those as well. Now, whether or not that manifests can have a lot to do with parts. So I have genetic predispositions for asthma and for migraine headaches. And if I'm in a dusty room and I'm stirring up a lot of dust, I'll have an asthma attack got nothing to do with my parts. But hmm. if for some reason a part's scared and wants to take me out, it might give me a migraine headache, push that migraine button. And so with a lot of medical symptoms, we start by having the client focus on whatever it is. We did an outcome study with rheumatoid arthritis and that was very successful because we would have people focus on the pain, get curious about it, ask what it wanted them to know, and we would hear from the parts that were sabotaging them and hated the caretaking part that dominated their life and didn't let them take care of themselves. And as we worked out a, a time-sharing thing with those sets of parts, the pain, some people got totally into remission, but most people got a whole lot better. So that's the perspective, is that there is some kind of a button that 
these parts can use to get your attention or to screw up your life if they want to. But if you find why they're doing it and you shift that, then they don't have to keep pushing the button. And just to be crystal clear, so Dick, you're saying that in that study, it was not just that people's tolerance for stable levels of pain increased through mindfulness, self-acceptance, and so forth, but the actual pain of the rheumatoid arthritis decreased, implying Absolutely. that it had, to some extent at least, a psychogenic, as it were, origin, right? It was a good study with a control group. We published it in the Journal of Rheumatology. Yeah. That's an enormous result. Yeah. With many implications. How do you deal with people who then, in a weird way, get caught up in blaming themselves? So we do a lot of work with those kinds of critics, and I would have you focus on it, finding your body. How do you feel toward it? I would work to get you curious about it. Yeah. Because most people hate those parts. And once you were, I would have you ask it, what's it afraid would happen if it didn't call you names all day or blame you or shame you all day? Mm -hmm. And there are three common answers to that. The one is, I have to do this to get you to, to motivate you to yeah. try harder, to work harder, to do that. That was what my, that was mine. Uh, and thanks, Dad. The second, <laughs> really, exactly. It was my dad's voice. <laughs> the second one, often it's if I let you feel good about yourself, you're going to take risks and you're going to get hurt. So I've got to keep you down. Yeah. The fear keeps you safe. Yeah. yeah. So I, if I can make you feel like shit, then you're not going to get hurt. But there's always some kind of positive uh, intention, almost always. Sometimes they're just pissed at you for various reasons, like the arthritis patients. Related to this, I, I had a reflection. I was talking with Forrest about this and getting you know, ready to prepare uh, to some extent to talk with you, which I'm extremely enjoying. The notion, if you may know it, uh, in the Buddhist psychology of the first art and the second art of life. Um, no, it's, mm -hmm. oh, this might be helpful. I don't know. Oh, this is, this is going to be great, actually. Yeah. yeah. So let's say a person is experiencing physical pain, or maybe they've had a loss and they're experiencing sorrow. Okay. Or maybe they recognize they've done something that for them, genuinely, it feels like it's appropriate to have remorse about. All right. That's the so-called first art of life, kind of. I think of it as primary, uh, quote unquote, negative experiencing, painful, you know, okay, there it is. That itself is not a problem. The problem starts when we add the second darts that we throw ourselves of our defensive maneuvers, our exiling, our firefighting. So, so much of the mm -hmm. um, that which is uh, addressed through IFS strikes me more in that second dart category. It doesn't Sorry. mean that, let's say, the sadness at losing your cat will go away. It's just that right. it's a lot easier to, to bear it and be with it in the context of capital S self as a whole. Totally agree with that. And if you go to that grieving part and embrace it, it'll still feel sad and feel the loss. Yeah. But it will feel the comfort yeah. of not being alone with all that, or not being, like you're saying, not being shamed for having it. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. It's great. Thank you. Yeah, this is great for me too. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> could I could I ask you about how, because we're getting toward the end here, and I, I could, I'm could i just trying to imagine somebody who's listened to this conversation to this point, which has been wide ranging. We've explored a lot of stuff here in a very cool way. But they might also be going, well, wait, 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 wait. You said a lot of parts inside of the self. I got all the different things kind of going on. And a lot of the, the things that are frustrating me about the way my life is or the way that my behavior structure works with other people or how I show up in relationships or whatever else are kind of tied to the behavior of these various entities inside that I really authentically don't have like a great feel for right now. I, I don't... I don't know who the characters are involved in the play. I'm not really sure where they come from. I don't really understand what their function is, but you're telling me I got them in me somewhere. How do you typically go through a process when somebody's beginning this kind of work mm -hmm. of, of developing that self-insight into the structure of what's going on? 
It's actually, for most people, a lot simpler than you might think. Somebody comes in and they describe a problem. They're totally naive to IFS and talk about their problem. And as they do, I'm saying, oh, so one part of you says this to you when this happens. Is that right? Yeah, that, yeah that's right. Oh, and then another part that makes you do this. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Oh, because they're just telling me their story and I'm just translating it into that language. And mm -hmm. most mm -hmm. people already use that language. So, which is why I use the word part. Doesn't, didn't serve me that well in, you know, academia, but it's, you know, if I said one of your sub personalities does this and one of your ego states does that, they say, what are you talking about? So people say, yeah. And we've got in that opening five minutes, maybe three, four parts on board that they've described mm. that you said, okay. And then I would say, do you want to change or help any of them change? Or do you want to get to know them in a different way? Or are you interested in a lot of people are okay with that much, but when I tell them to go and focus on it and start talking to it, like it's going to, then there, sometimes there's this big pushback. Like, what do you think I'm Sybil or you know, uh -huh. I don't hear voices. What do you mean? But if you can get past that, and also some people will say, I don't hear anything. I don't see anything, which means generally they're in their head and there's a thinking part that's keeping them from feeling much in their body. And so we have to start with that part usually. Um, I don't know if I'm getting to your question exactly, Forrest, but... You, you are, you are, and you're talking about working with people. I'm wondering a, oh, just a little bit from own, the stance... On their own. Yeah, of like people on their own, how can they investigate themselves or go through this process with themselves, yeah. A lot of it is just getting curious, just taking uh, an emotion or a sensation inside of yourself and, you know starting with a kind of mindfulness place, separate from it and get into that mindful state and then just start following your curiosity. The, the big difference is in IFS, you expect a response. <laughs> so if you start asking, what do you want me to know to your critic or to your anger or is it, you're going to get an answer if you're just in a purely curious place. If the part mm. thinks you're, you've got an attitude toward it, it's not going to talk to you. That's right. That's really right. That was one of the big lessons for me doing parts work, that if, if the, kind of the core functionality had an agenda vis-a-vis -a, -vis a part, not right. It, he's no, complete, that's right. Um, not quite, it's neutrality or kindness, you know. Yeah. That's right. Necessary. I, I was reflecting also on qualities you have, um, Dick. It's a C. I don't know if it's in your C list. Courage. Yes, it is one of the C words. Oh, good. I'm glad. I, I think <laughs> we're thinking about the professional courage you had to have and also differentiating from your dad and all courage. But yeah. just the inner courage it takes, I think, for us, for, for a civilian, a regular person, not you know deep in the weeds and receiving IFS therapy, uh, the courage to, to shift perspective. And it, That's right. to look, in effect, look at yourself through other eyes, inside yourself, right? And we haven't really named this particular, I'll just say for myself, that something that has helped me to access these different parts um, is to tune into the somatic sense of each of them, mm -hmm. the nuance, right. the texture. Like, what does it feel yeah. like? I'll, I'll do it now, people can see it in the camera, to, to the, the scared, soft, little child, you know, I'm already doing it, you know, like, like that. And, you know, or maybe another part that's like a, like a righteous, outraged critic. I'm leaning forward. Forrest knows this part of me. I've tried to regulate it over the years. Like, what? You know, you just feel it in your body. And so tuning into the body of it, and, if, and even you can help yourself, if you're willing on your own, to kind of move slightly into the posture of it. You know, it can kind of help you get in touch also with that part of yourself. Totally agree. And, and before we started, I was saying that I have this condition of aphantasia, where in contrast to most people who see images, I don't see anything when I work inside. So I have to rely on 
kind of thing you just said, mm -hmm. which is how do they manifest in a somatic or physical way? And then, then I can dialogue with them and I'll hear the voice isn't exactly right, but I'll hear thoughts coming from them and I'll be able to dialogue with them. Yeah, a view or a perspective, yeah. a line, yeah, yeah. And I think that to loop back to something I asked a while ago uh, here, this is some of the value of the model itself, just to like a normal yes, person yeah. who might never walk yes. into a therapeutic space. The because what you're saying, Dick, which is actually really profound if you if you think about it, is that there is something about this whole thing that is kind of intuitive to people if they open up to the possibility of it. Yeah. Where if they're able to shift into a stance where, hey, what if? What if there was this whole cosmology inside of me? What if there were these different parts with these different motivations that influence my behavior in different ways? Once they're able to do that, if they start asking the questions, start going, hey, where, where is that coming from? Mm -hmm. Hey, what's going on with that? A lot of the time, they'll kind of get an answer. They get answers. You have to be willing to ask the questions. Yeah. yeah. And you have to be willing to kind of like give over to the model in some kind of a way. And look, there, there are different strokes for different folks. Yeah. People are gonna, some people are gonna be vastly benefited by this. Some people, they're gonna be like, hey, for whatever reason, maybe this model isn't for me. But if you're willing to give it a shot, at least in my experience, um, I think you're totally right on that for a lot of people, the part finding process is actually pretty intuitive, at least at a surface level, in terms of like who the big, big, big players in the room are. For some of the softer and more vulnerable parts, it can take a while maybe to get down to the bottom of that rabbit hole. Yeah. But in terms of the big loud voices, like people generally know. Yeah, they do know. And you were asking about how much can people do on their own and yeah. To make it safe, we'll generally say it's really um, useful to get to know your primary protectors. But before going to and trying to heal these exile parts, typically that's a lot more delicate. And you may need to at least have a, a friend with you or um, ideally maybe a therapist because uh, it that can be a little challenging by yourself. I mean, there are people that do the whole thing by themselves and swear by it, but to encourage people to do that, there is a percentage of people that are going to have some trouble with it and have back backlash and stuff. You have a familiar model for you, transactional analysis, inner child, critical parent, nurturing parent, mm -hmm. and then updated, right? Uh, the, if you will, victim and then perpetrator rescuer, or the way I like to think of it is sort of the, you know, the beleaguered self or the, the this kind of put upon, and then the inner nurturer, inner attackers. And then think of the, thinking of those inner nurturers as a kind of committee, a caring committee, and inner right. attackers in much the same way. And then in that frame, uh, just naming it itself is really quite useful because where often I yeah. think the action is for people is not so much around the attackers, quote unquote, I always knew he was an asshole. But it's more the mm -hmm. failed protectors in their mm -hmm. personal history and the lack in themselves these days, uh, just factually no blame, uh, of strong inner protectors, inner nurturers. So starting by building up the inner nurturers first before trying to you know, come to terms more with the inner attackers, let alone the exiled parts, I find often is a progression that people can manage. What do you think of that? Yeah, I like that. Uh, although... The inner nurturer, uh, ideally, what I'm calling self will be the biggest inner nurturer. Yeah. Because some of these parts, these caretaking parts or these what we call self-like parts, are over-promoted and they, they carry too much responsibility oh, for nurturing you and, 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 and everybody else. Yeah. I find functionally for a lot of people, they're they're really weak, like soothing or compassion or in, or encouragement yeah. or guidance distinct from criticism that tend to be fairly underdeveloped. What do you think of that? Well, um, they're overridden by these, these yeah. uh, Very. what you call perpetrators. Attackers. It's kind of like you know, yeah. Godzilla and Bambi. You know, <laughs> you know, Bambi get bigger. Totally. Well, you can try to beef up Bambi. Yeah. Like, 
typically I'll go the other way and I'll try to get the attacking parts yeah. to drop their weapons and transform first. I wonder if that's risky for a person to do on their own. That isn't so risky. It's, it's getting to the parts that these attackers are trying to protect mm. that can be risky. Aha. Uh -huh. But, that's useful. but um, you know, as long as this guy doesn't want you to feel good, yeah, and you try to get your nurturers going, he's going to get even stronger. So that's the systems aspect of it. Interesting. Well, then building on this, and as we finish, I want to connect uh, the fundamental enabling condition for a person to do this work effectively to the fundamental enabling condition necessary in a society as a whole mm -hmm. for it to work with its parts. Mm -hmm. And I was just reflecting that what enables what you're doing, what we're talking about to work, it seems to me, is accessing the capital S self, which That's is provided right. sometimes through the auxiliary self, as it were, of the therapist, who, right? And just this inquiry, this curiosity, okay, the courage to, to stay, to hold the frame. Okay, great. Right? You need that. And then I was yep. going out to America these days. And the, 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 we have these parts. So I start thinking about how can we manage these parts? But to be able to manage the parts of our society writ large, we need that fundamental capacity to connect with capital S self at the level of country as a whole which for me has to totally. do with fundamental institutions and cultures of civil society. Respect for the rule of law at bottom, willingness to yeah. peaceful transfer of power, things like that. That's and when right. that itself is undermined, much as it is in a person, it's hard to, it's hard to adjust the ecosystem of the mind, the ecology of mind, Bateson's term in a helpful way. It's really hard to do that in a society of a society doesn't have access to its version of capital S self. It strikes me. Okay, what do you think about all that? Totally agree. I mean, that when, I, when I'm thinking about larger systems, it's checking, is there, do we have access to enough self? And yeah. in the U.S., in the U.S., that's, it's really decreased enormously. And the other thing you see, and this is true of people too, is after, um, 9-11, you know, after certain kinds of traumatic events, there's a big increase in anxiety generally. And now with climate change and mm. AI dangers and, yeah, yeah. and also um, with the disparity in income and so many people living paycheck to paycheck, and there's huge amounts of exiles in our culture, in our country. And those people are looking for a redeemer, a savior. They're looking for a, fire, a super firefighter, which is super say? firefighter, strong man on a horse. That's the classic. Exactly. And so that's the firefighter that these exiles are looking to. Yeah. So it's, you know, it can be applied to a lot of different things. Are you hopeful looking out of humanity? Maybe that's our final question. I'm 74 and I'm still working really hard. And the reason is, Similar to what you were saying, that I, in, in working with clients um, who, when we start out, it looks totally hopeless because mm. they're so dominated by these protectors and there's no self to be found. But as soon as we get what, what we might call the critical mass of self, as soon as they can access that, things change really quickly. So since I've seen that in many clients, I have a kind of hope that that's possible in much, much bigger systems. We're talking with someone, obviously, you're going to be in the history books. You know, uh, so I think about the folks I read about when I was in you know, grad school or taking classes. People are going to be reading about you for a long time. Thank you. We have this mutual admiration thing going. It's really great. That's good. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> this is, I, I, I feel like we could just kind of keep going here. I know. I did too. Maybe but truly, really, Dr. Schwartz, like, thanks so much for doing this today. This has been really wonderful. This has been a very unique conversation. I've loved it. Honestly, I really have. So it's really been great. And it's great to see your relationship. I'm very, very, very fortunate. I'm glad you were able to keep that critic off of Forrest's back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I yeah. almost we, entirely. We all, we was. all made it through. We, <laughs> my father we, wasn't we, we so found, good at it. We found our way through occasionally stormy seas, but we found our way, and that's what really mattered. What um, this has been really great. Again, thanks so much, Dick. You're very welcome, guys. I really loved today's conversation, and one of my favorite parts about it was just listening to Dr. Schwartz and Rick go back and forth. These are two people who have thought about the mind really, really deeply, and they come at it from kind of different angles. And seeing them interact and go back and forth while also having clearly just like so much respect and appreciation for one another was really lovely uh, and was really fun to be a part of. And that started pretty much right off the bat because we began the conversation with kind of the end in mind. IFS has this notion of a self with a capital S, and it's kind of what people are going for. It's our target. It's what happens when all of the different parts inside of us quiet down and are in the right roles. This other thing sort of emerges and comes forward. But in the Buddhist tradition, as you might know, not self is really more the target to massively oversimplify here. And so Rick and Dr. Schwartz just went back and forth about what we mean when we talk about a self. What's the nature of the self? How does the uh, capital S self and IFS uh, different to or the same with how we think about the self in more Buddhist theory and practice? And what are the kind of commonalities and differences here? in these approaches. Even before then, I asked for a general framework of IFS from Dr. Schwartz. And so I'm going to give that again here toward the end. Uh, if you were listening to this conversation and you were going, wait, like defenders and firefighters and exiles, what are we talking about here? I'll do my best to break it down for you uh, at the end of the podcast. So the whole notion of IFS, the whole structural framework of it, is that we have what's called multiplicity of mind. There are these different parts, different characters, different sub-personalities, call them what you will, that are running around inside of us. And each of these parts have their own agendas, their own role inside of our collective system. They all think that they're doing good. And this is really, really critical. It's actually the title of Dr. Schwartz's book, No Bad Parts. Parts might have dysfunctional behaviors or be in problematic roles in our overall system, but the part itself is not evil. It's not ill in its intent. It's trying to do what it thinks is the right thing to do. And this is one of the great insights of IFS. And it's one of the, the lessons that we could take into our own life. It's one of the parts of it that has been incredibly useful for me personally, which is to view my behaviors through a less pathological lens and to be more compassionate and understanding toward the behavior of my various parts. Parts are typically grouped into three large categories. There are managers, firefighters, and exiles. Managers are the parts of us that kind of keep the trains running on time. They tend to be uh, more disciplined, more task-focused, and uh, they tend to live a bit more cognitively for most people. Firefighters are the parts that jump in when we are beginning to experience the painful feelings that are often associated with our exile parts. Uh, these are the classically quote-unquote problematic behaviors that a lot of people have are typically tied to their firefighters. It's possible that Dr. Schwartz would push back there on my usage of the word problematic, um, but if you think about addictive behaviors or more consumptive behaviors, these are ones that are associated with firefighters. The body is experiencing pain in some kind of a way, and so it goes to a soothing behavior like consuming excessive drugs or alcohol or other substances. And that's just one example. There are many, many different kinds of firefighters and many, many different kinds of defensive behaviors that a person could have. And that gets to one of the underlying themes of the whole conversation. Defenses exist for reasons. There are reasons why we do the things that we do. And most of the time, these reasons are extremely understandable. The behavior might be dysfunctional in terms of the ends that we're searching for out in the world, but it's coming from a pretty justified place in terms of the experience of the part that's motivating that behavior. And this can, again, help us view ourselves more inclusively. The problems for people emerge when they try to push their parts away, when they don't include them in the overall system, when they try to push them into problematic roles, when we don't think of them as being aspects of ourselves that are at least in some way authentic to us. And this gets to the third family of parts that people have, which are exiles. 
these are the parts that are carrying the pain of the system. These are the parts that really, really felt that painful thing that happened to you when you were younger. For example, Dr. Schwartz talked about a lack of nurturance in his own life and some of the difficult experiences that he had with his parents when he was growing up. And this part of him that felt hurt or pushed aside or not cared for, not valued for who he was. From there, I asked Dr. Schwartz to go through a pretty specific case study of a kind of person who might walk into therapy and the kind of work that he would do with that person. And this is somebody who had more classic anxious attachment issues. Maybe they're more of a highly sensitive person. They get overwhelmed emotionally. There's this quality of a kind of clinging complaint directed at other people. And that was starting to create a lot of problems in that person's life and in their relationships. And I asked Dr. Schwartz for how he would start working with that person. From there, the conversation expanded out again, where we talked about uh, why personify parts at all? Like, what's the value of doing that? And Dr. Schwartz, I think, you know, with a, with a lot of patience said, well, part of the value is that I just think this is how things actually are ontologically. But in addition to that, hey, here's why it's psychologically useful to think in this kind of way. And again, it all comes back to unifying. It comes back to compassion, consideration, unifying the system as a whole, getting on the same side as these parts. Being, in a word, non-pathologizing about how we treat our internal system. And then Rick and Dr. Schwartz closed the conversation by talking about the more systemic ways that we can think about IFS, how we can apply IFS systems thinking to larger systems, uh, whether it's our families or a company, a group of friends, hey, even a country or the global community altogether. How are we interacting with each other in ways that are creating different exiles and pushing groups of people away when health is found, if we can, in integrating the whole system? I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. I had a wonderful time recording it today. And if you've been listening to the podcast for a while and would like to support us, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And if you would like to check out more from me, you can find me on Substack. And I've included a link to that in the description of today's podcast episode. Hey, and if you'd like to support the podcast even more simply than that, the best way you can is by telling other people about it. That always really helps us out. So until next time, thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you soon.